OK, so I'm going to talk about the confusion of things. Uh, I'm going to rant for a couple of minutes to start with. Uh, and then uh, we're going to talk a bit about um, what a platform is, what an IoT platform is, and what are the constraints you can use to cut through the marketing nonsense and pick a platform. So I look like this on the internet. Um, and everything is actually pretty awesome um, if you cut out the horrible marketing materials, etc., that we have on the IoT domain. And the other thing we're doing a terrible job of as engineers, um, again, sadly, you know, driven by marketing as well, uh, we're, we're really coming up with terrible applications for IoT. So this is where I start ranting. Um, so this is a very, very good example of why you know, IoT is getting the bad rep that it's getting. Um, if only we could find a way to make notes stick to a fridge. Like we don't actually need a you know, Twitter connected, um, and I'm not kidding, there's actually a Twitter app and this is a door of a fridge. You know, this is unnecessary. Um, or, I mean, uh, this, I'm not a dentist, so I don't know like, if this is a real problem, but like, we, I, I think we don't really need toothbrushes with Bluetooth enabled, you know. So this provides some you know, real-time brushing guidance <laughs> and personalized dental care journeys, everyone. Again, not a dentist, but somehow I think this is a terrible, you know, example. Or, like, we don't need engineers explaining how to, you know, IPv6 enable your coffee brewer. You know, it's just, you know, if you look at, if you search for IoT on Google Images, you get this thing, which is, you know, it's a bubble. It's, it's, it's literally a bubble, if you think about it. It's just this generic notion of a cloud. Now, speaking of the cloud, the cloud has been or have been has having this problem for a long time. You know, you, you end up with these cloud applications that are just a mishmash of, you know, different technologies. You know, um, why do you even use MongoDB? So it's just, it's just, things are terrible. Things are very bad. But then you get applications like the radiation monitoring that Safecast guys did. And this is actually an amazing application of IoT. Um, if you don't know about this, they distributed some Geiger, Geiger counter kits um, around the Fukushima district and around Japan and around the world now as well. And, um, you know, they allowed, you know, impartial and honest monitoring um, for disaster relief. And there are loads of other environmental applications like this, you know, uh, water monitoring, um, air pollution detection and that kind of stuff. So I, I somehow feel these are not getting the attention that they need and you know, all the consumer goods, because they happen to have bigger marketing budgets, are getting you know, a lot of attention and that's actually giving IoT a very bad name. Um, and healthcare is another area where IoT can help really, really well. And um, again, I kind of feel that we're not really getting, um, or we're not really giving them enough attention. So. That's my rant over. Let's talk about hardware. Um, now, an IoT application, as you can appreciate, consists of many different components. Um, starting with the lowest level, um, like a bottom-up approach, you have these nodes or you know, devices that are deployed around the field. Uh, these could simply be your cell phone. They could be sensor nodes. They could have a variety of different processing devices on them different sensors, different inputs, different outputs. And then um, generally you have these central nodes that the little nodes connect to and you know, relay information to if they're not directly connected to the internet. Um, generally referred to as hubs. And um, going like further, you could also include all the data processing that you do and servers to be part of the IoT devices as well. Um, with many devices and different architectures, you have the you know, responsibility to manage them. Uh, this includes the registration, how do they actually get associated with user accounts. Uh, you need to monitor them. If they go offline, what do you do? Do you panic? Um, and the general orchestration of things. So, and data is everything these days. So you do have data services which collect and you know, do per, per rather perform some an analytics on the data and so that they can be sold for money. Um, and then you have mobile apps, you have web pages. There needs to be some communication endpoints that these things can connect to as well. So overall, an IoT platform is actually quite a complex bit of um, architecture. 
And if you look at um, vendor websites, they all claim to offer the full stack solution to everything, of course. But the problem is um, it's a tie-in to a particular vendor. And most of these ecosystems don't actually play well together or connect well together. Um, it's, a bit, it's a case of, oh, there are 20 competing standards. Let's create you know, yet another one and let's you know, raise some money, whatever. And the problem is now you have 21 different competing standards. So choosing an IoT platform is actually quite a complex device. Today I'm going to focus mostly on the hardware side of things, choosing which hardware platform to use. And I've broken that down into uh, several categories. So the first one is connectivity. Um, this is very simple. Uh, depending on the application, you may want to have, I don't know, GSM connectivity or Wi-Fi connectivity or some form of connectivity to get the data out of the devices. The first characteristic of an IoT device is that it's somehow interconnected with everything else, um, Internet of Things. So. Yeah, the, the, the questions you have to ask yourself is, how does the communication happen? Does the device have direct connection to the internet or does it have to go through a hub? Um, and other things you need to keep in mind is, like you get this radio device, how do you actually get it to talk to other things? Well, how, what's the setup process going to look like? And I feel this is an area that we're failing as engineers um, to like, make simple. Of course, there's limitations around this. You're not going to get a random RF device talking to your iPhone or whatever. But this is an area that you need to keep in mind as well. And the other thing is application-dependent uh, processing requirements. So do you have, I don't know, high-definition high cameras that you need to process frames out of? Um, how much local processing do you have to do? This is very important in choosing a device that will run your system because I mean, realistically, you're not going to hook up an HD camera to an Arduino. So um, that's one of the key constraints as well. And everything is getting mobile and you know, portable. So is this device going to be battery powered? Because if that's the case, you probably cannot afford to put a 64-core you know, processing device on a you know, single tiny cell battery. So uh, physical size is a, is a factor. Uh, is this thing going to be pocketable? Is it going to be mounted on a wall somewhere? And ultimately cost. So this is both the cost of the device that you're putting together and the operational cost. Keep in mind these things are connected, so you need to provide some back-end services to them and that needs to stay up for these devices to be functional. Um, and a very good example to this uh, connectivity and operational cost is um, what happens when the vendor you choose for your connectivity and data analytics and stuff like that goes down. You have devices in the field, you know, trying to reach this backend server, but that company has gone out of business because they pivoted. They decided to, I don't know, write a messaging app for an iPhone or something. So um, this is actually quite an important thing, both from a cost standpoint and from your app for your application standpoint as well. That's outside of the scope of this talk, so I'm not going to go into that. Now, this is a question uh, that comes up very often. Should you use these? Um, depends on what you're doing, obviously. But if you're designing something, like if you're designing a one-off system or if you're just producing 20 of something, the answer is it really doesn't matter. Because ultimately, you know, it's, you're not going to go into production with this and you can you know, beat any of these things into submission to do whatever you want. Again, you know, you're not going to get connect high-speed cameras to an Arduino, but if you want Raspberry Pi to talk random RF protocols, you can just get a dongle and drive it from Linux. So um, what follows is uh, mainly focusing on going into production and actually designing something custom as, as opposed to these. I'm going to be talking about what kind of processing devices that reside on these boards uh, and focus mainly on the, on the architectures and the platforms in general, as opposed to brand names. So this is a very informal categorization of these devices. You have small embedded devices, and these are eight 16-bit micros, um, general purpose. They don't really have, I mean, they might have a particular application, but they're general purpose in that they support multiple protocols. Um, you have larger embedded devices. These are 
ARM Cortex series, slightly larger um, and faster. They have, you know, DMAs, different channel DMAs. They have a lot more complexity. Um, and then you have Linux-capable SOCs. Um, so to give you an example, small embedded would be Arduino. Um, large embedded would be, say, the Disco STM um, F7 board or um, some, I think there's a board called Maple, which runs on a Cortex-M3, uh, like an Arduino. Linux-capable SOCs are things you would find on Raspberry Pis or BeagleBones and stuff like that. These things just run Linux effectively. And then you can repurpose PC class devices uh, into, you know, your little IoT device or a hub or something along the lines of that. So it's 10 a.m., so let's look at some architectural diagrams. Um, so this is, this is, I'm not going to go into very much detail. I just wanted to show you the differences between these, these, these different devices. So this is a, an 8-bit CPU, and it's architecturally, it's super simple. There's a, a CPU core, and then you have some peripherals. These peripherals are very low level. I'm talking UART, I squared C, SPI, that kind of stuff. No USB, although you can get some USB on some micros now. Um, but an application for this would be uh, a low-power um, wireless sensor node. Uh, now, this by itself does not support wireless, um, but this architecture in specific, uh, specifically. But the idea would be, you know, this device would be sleeping most of the time. It's really not doing much. It's just grabbing a couple of sensor data and pushing it to a central hub or something. Um, an example uh, of a wireless, you know, embedded would be the ESP8266. Not going to go into too much detail. Matt is going to talk about this at, I think, in about 40 minutes or so. Um, but this is, a, this is a small CPU core with Wi-Fi bundled onto it uh, in a single package, which in quantity you can get for silly little prices. Um, so, you know, the first example I, give, I gave is probably more suited to run on this. Um, but as you can see, the peripherals are still very simple. They're just SPI, GPIO. There is no PCI Express. There is no USB. Uh, so the applications are quite limited into, again, small sensor nodes or that kind of applications. And then you have, you know, beasts like um, the BCM2835. Um, in you actually have different devices on the same chip. So you have the GPU, and then you have the CPU and you have all the peripherals that are on the, on the CPU itself. Um, an example application to this, and in fact, uh, if I remember correctly, the main reason this chip was designed was this was meant to go into setup boxes where you have an HDMI out, and the CPU just grabs stuff from the internet and then pushes it to the GPU to be decoded as H.264. So this, I mean, you could do you know, little sensor applications with this, but this would be more suited for something that's connected to the internet and runs um, any generic software package because it's running Linux. Um, so, yeah, and on the same way as this, um, this is coming more and more, becoming more and more common, repurposing SO system on chip devices uh, that are designed to run access points and routers, home routers. Um, these devices generally have a Linux-capable SOC or a processing core. And then what they have is quite spectacular in that, you know, al alongside the low-level interfaces such as GPIOs, UART, etc., they have USBs, they have PCIe Express cards and stuff like that. And one thing that's great about these things is that they're super cheap for what you're getting. And um, now the, the only problem is you're not going to go to MediaTek or, Ather or Qualcomm Atheros or whatever and say, can I buy 10 chips? So actually de designing with these things becomes more complex. You, the general idea is that you get a router board and then repurpose it to your you know, application. And if you're going into production, you talk to OEMs and ODMs to actually customize an existing design. But they have Wi-Fi integrated into them and they have all these high-level interfaces. So an example application to this would be if you had, um, say, you know, a custom you know, FPGA application that required really high throughputs to the co uh, core system and you used PCI Express to connect to it and so on. Again, you're not going to, if you really wanted to, you could do sensor applications with this, but that's better suited for the small embedded and somewhat large embedded devices. And this is yet another example of uh, an SOC for a router. Um, and you can see that it's, 
generally they are all the same. They, they have some form of Wi-Fi and uh, they have PCIe and USB and so on. Um, one thing, again, these are great for applications that need to run some form of, I don't know, Linux daemon or when you don't really want to program things very low level and you need connectivity and so on. So you can, of course, do connectivity to the outside world with, f with small micros, but this is running Linux, so you could, you could reuse any existing uh, package very easily for that kind of stuff. So let's have a quick look at the key constraints that we talked about. Um, so we have connectivity, how do these things connect to each other and the internet and the users effectively. What kind of processing we need? Do we need to do hardcore you know, image processing on the device, some DSPs to do signal processing? Um, or can we just use the device just as a data acquisition device and then push it to the cloud for some server to do processing on? Is this thing going to be battery powered uh, or are you plugged into the wall? Do you have the luxury of burning watts and actually not caring about it? Um, what kind of size this thing is going to run on and ultimately what the cost of this whole operation is going to be. So once you've you know, come up with a short list of devices, comes the next phase because the hardware platform you choose is effectively going to dictate how you're going to develop your application or your system. So um, if you choose to go for, uh, say, an 8-bit processor, you're not going to be able to run a high-level virtual machine with concurrency. And I mean, you can, but you really, there's no point in doing that. Um, and likewise, if you go up to the level of a Linux SOC, you know, programming that in ASM probably is not the best way to go about it. Um, so it's going to dictate what kind of language you're going to be using and what kind of frameworks you will have at your disposal. So if you, if you go for one of the solutions from an IoT vendor that's full stack, they probably will give you um, effectively uh, an IDE that you use, probably on the cloud, something that runs on the device, that takes care of deployment and stuff. You know, that's the entirely up to you. Do you want to rely on a vendor or do you want to do your own cloud? Uh, but ultimately, how you program this device is entirely, you know, uh, down to what device, uh, what system or what device you're going to choose. And another important thing is the data model that you'll be using. So, uh, again, on a small 8-bit micro, you're not going to do protocol buffers or, you know, something heavy like that. So, you know, it, it all depends on what combination of devices you have in your system to determine how communication is going to be architected on those. Another very important thing on IoT is security and firmware updates. Um, so again, let's go with 8-bit micros. Doing SSL and that kind of stuff on that kind of devices is very difficult. You may choose a device that has a crypto coprocessor that will take care of that for you. Um, but again, that's something to keep in mind. And how do you get firmware updates to the devices safely and securely, um, you know, is another thing. Most IoT companies, I'm not going to say most, some IoT companies say, oh, we'll just, you know, ship this very old version of Linux. And, you know, actually they don't care about patching it. And then you have cases where, you know, oh, you know, hundred thousands of routers got compromised because they were running an old version of OpenSSL or something like that. So firmware update management in IoT is a very, very important thing and I just wish people pay, paid more attention to it. And ultimately, the entire characteristic of the system is going to be a sum of all the uh, devices that you put together uh, and, you know, how you're going to present that data or what you're going to do with that data. This gets into the business domain, so I'm not going to go into that. So with all that said, um, if you're interested in playing with some IoT devices or IoT systems and stuff, I'm running a workshop on Sunday, i.e. tomorrow. Um, we have ten, we have nine boards, um, so we have eight, nine spaces available. If you're interested, come and find me when we're grabbing a cup of tea or coffee. And um, that's me done. Thank you very much if you have any questions.